And we're back. We're back for our second video in chemical bonding. In the first one, we looked at the basic types, ionic bonds, covalent bonds. Today, as you can see, we're looking at polar covalent. Now, it comes out of that question I left you with. What happens if? Is there anything in between? So you kind of knew the answer was going to be yes, there is something in between. Today, I'm going to start you with a question. What's the chemical formula for coffee? We'll come back to that at the end. Until then, we're going to talk about polar covalent bonds. Now, let's remind ourselves what we already know about bonds. We know that there's ionic bonds, and we know there's covalent bonds. And ionic bonds form between a metal and a nonmetal. There's an electron transfer. Metal loses, nonmetal gains. They form a cation for the metal and an anion for the nonmetal. And they get together in a solid structure we call a crystal lattice. And when we finally get a chemical formula, we actually call it a formula unit, not really a molecule. Although, if we do call it a molecule, it's not technically not correct, but nobody's really going to get excited about it. Covalent bonds, on the other hand, happen between two nonmetals, and they involve an electron sharing, and those are the true molecules. One of the reasons we said that ionic bonds form between metals and nonmetals, and covalent bonds form between two nonmetals had to do with electronegativity. Nonmetals have a higher electronegativity, so they pull electrons toward themselves. And metals have a low electronegativity, so they don't. But we also know that the trend in electronegativity occurs all the way across the periodic table. So even within the nonmetals, we have an increase in electronegativity. And if I look at electronegativity as an increasing thing, because before we looked at it as a decreasing, left to right it was increasing, top to bottom it was decreasing, but if I look at it as always increasing, then it's going to go up. And apparently I don't draw up arrows very well. But upward, it increases. So if I combine those two, then I realize that even within nonmetals, I'm going to have significant differences in electronegativity. But let's start with chlorine. Let's start with a simple one we looked at before. When that was our example of a, of a covalent bond. We know that covalent bonding occurs when we have a sharing of electrons. So the orbits overlap, or energy levels overlap, the electrons get shared, and I could think of these this pair of electrons spending part of their time orbiting the chlorine on the left, part of their time orbiting the chlorine on the right. I can draw it as a simple uh, electron dot diagram or Lewis diagram like this, or I can draw the shared electrons as a line. So that line represents a pair of electrons. Nice and simple, we've seen it before. But if I move on to say something different, where I've got hydrogen chlorine, I have, uh, well, obviously hydrogen's going to be a different one, and hydrogen now has one energy level with one electron. And more than that, hydrogen over here on the left has an electronegativity value of 2.1. Let's try that again so you can actually see it. Has an electronegativity value of 2.1, and chlorine on the left has an electronegativity of 3.0. That means chlorine is going to pull the electrons closer to itself than hydrogen does. Pulls the electrons more strongly. What is that going to do to the bond? Well, I've tried to draw it this way. So this shared pair of electrons, hydrogen uh, is, the nucleus is no longer dead center, but the electrons have been pulled closer to chlorine. What does that do to the molecule? One of the things it does, and it's kind of hard to draw in the Lewis diagram or the electron dot diagram, it kind of looks the same as it did with chlorine, and it kind of looks the same. But what I have to realize is that the electrons are being pulled closer to chlorine. And what that does is something approaching an ionic charge. And we draw it this way. So you're not going to see this a lot because when I draw structures like I have on the bottom with just the electrons and the dashes and the dots and the symbols, uh, I don't draw in these funny symbols. But this here, that's the Greek letter delta. And you've seen capital delta in math before when you'd say talking about slopes. You had delta y or delta x. We're not talking about slope. We're not talking about that. But we are talking about the Greek letter delta. And in this case, you see the little charge there. It means partial. So we've got a partial positive charge on one side of the molecule, a partial negative charge on the other side of the molecule. Same Greek letter, different sign. Partial positive, partial negative. And the reason for that is because chlorine has pulled the electron closer to itself. Not all the way, 
off, so it's not a full positive charge or a full negative charge, but hydrogen has lost some of that electron, and chlorine has gained some of that electron, not all of it, just some. And that's going to have a profound influence on a lot of the properties. Not ionic, but it's approaching that. It's somewhere in the middle between a transfer and a share. If I compare the three types of bonds as I have them now, the first type we had last time was here, our nonpolar covalent bond. Actually, that was the second type, wasn't it? Where the electrons are being shared nice and equally. You can see the electrons, the electron density rather, nice and equally shared all around the atom. The first type of bond that we had, I'm backwards, the first type of bond was the ionic, where there was an electron transfer. So we see that these two ions now are separate from each other because there's no overlap of orbits, there's no sharing of electrons, uh, it's an electron transfer. Yes, they are being attracted to each other because of the opposite charges, but we draw it like that. Now what we have is somewhere in the middle. So we have this partial positive charge on one side, a partial negative charge on the other side, but you'll notice there is electron in between. So we do have a sharing of electrons, an overlap of orbitals, but one is pulling the electrons closer to itself than the other. Good question. How do we know? How do we know when it's going to be ionic, when it's going to be covalent, when it's going to be polar covalent? The bottom line is actually going to be fairly simple. If it's a metal, nonmetal compound, we're going to automatically assume it's ionic. Truth is, within ionic, there's going to be different degrees of sharing and transfer and so on. But for the most part, we're safe in assuming that a metal, nonmetal compound will be ionic. If it's a nonmetal, nonmetal, now we're going to have to decide. If the two atoms have close electronegativity, similar electronegativity, we'll call it nonpolar. If they are different in electronegativity, we'll call it polar. And of course, poles, if you think about a magnet, uh, can be thought of as two ends. That's our partial positive end, pole, and our partial negative end, the other pole. Well, how do we know if they're different in electronegativity? Well, we'll come to that in a moment. So. As a general guideline, and I really want to draw your attention down to this bottom line here, is that these numbers are arbitrary. So I wouldn't even write them down if I were you. But as a general guideline, if the electronegativity difference is quite small, we'll call it nonpolar. If it's quite large, it's probably ionic. And if it's in the middle, no, well, it's the one in the middle, the in-between. It's going to be polar covalent. Well, how do we know? There's two ways that we can know the electronegativity difference. The easiest way, which means the way you won't get to use very often, but the easiest way is if you have a periodic table that has electronegativity values. Now, the one in the back of your textbook does. Not quite as obvious as this, but it does. And I'll show those to you in class if you haven't found them in the meantime. So here I see, for example, hydrogen in element number 1, 2.1. Uh, if I go all the way to the left, oh, sorry, all the way to the right, and all the way to the top here with my fluorine electronegativity value of 4, and all the other elements are in there. So the electronegativity difference is if I were to compare, let's say, well, fluorine at 4 and hydrogen at 2.1, I do a subtraction, find the difference. The second way is knowing the trend, and the trend in the electronegativity is left to right, the electronegativity increases top to bottom, electronegativity decreases. And if I look here, I can see that, that that will help me a lot of times. There's always going to be some questions, well, what if and what if about that. But for the most part, the trend can answer most of those questions. If they're close together on the periodic table, they'll be close together in electronegativity. Now, what we want to do is we want to take one more look at some of the properties. We want to take a look at some of the uh, the differences, uh, how they behave, and so on. I need to show you something outside of this. So give me a second. I'll be right back. I have not forgotten about the coffee yet, but we'll come back to that at the end of the video. Be right back. Okay, we're back. Hopefully this works. Uh, what we have here is a computer simulation of uh, covalent bonds so that where we can make them either more or less polar. So what I have at the top, I've got a thing for atom A, which I can have a slider for making the electronegativity more or less. I have one for atom B, where I could make the electronegativity more or less. I've got a couple of other things I can do with it. I've got something here called a bond dipole. And the dipole is going to be an arrow that 
grows or shrinks depending on how strong the partial charges are. Now you can see that there's no bond dipole given because both atom A and atom B have the same electronegativity. Uh, I can do partial charges. We'll actually turn that one on as well, even though, again, because of the same electronegativity, you're not going to see anything. And I have options down here. Now, what I want for right now, I'll be turning this one off and on a little bit, is electron density. And what electron density does is it gives me a look around to say that the electrons, because it's evenly shaded, they're evenly distributed between those, those atoms. Okay, so I'm going to turn that back off for a moment. So what I want to do is I want to take elect the electronegativity of atom A and I want to turn it up. I'm going to increase it. Now, normally in a nomenclature question or even on a, on a diagram, we would often put the less electronegative element, maybe the metal, uh, on the left. In this case, just for something else I want to show you, I'm going to put it on the right. So we kind of have it a bit backwards from what we're accustomed to. However, I want to show you a couple of things. Number one, the bond dipole. Because atom A has more electronegativity, it's pulling electrons toward itself. That also gives it a partial charge here that's just tiny and it's just coming up as little delta negative. And B, atom B over here, of course, has a partial positive charge. If I turn my electron density field back on, now it's not equally shaded. Hope you can see that. But atom A is darker uh, than the cloud around atom B. And if I make atom A even more so, bond dipole gets bigger, the partial charge gets larger, maybe the uh, the shading got a little bit darker and, and lighter, as the case may be. I'm going to turn that surface off now. Now there's one more thing I want to show you. So what I have is a partial bond, sorry, not a partial bond, rather, partial charge on A, partially negative, partially positive charge on B, and I have a dipole. So I've got a polar covalent bond. I've got one end, one pole over here, another pole over here. The word we use for two is di, a dipole, two poles. More importantly, I've got this option for electric field. If I had a polar covalent bond in an electric field, don't forget, opposite charges attract like charges repel. If I turn my electric field on, then my electric field is going to have plus and minus charges as well, then that molecule is going to respond to the charges. So the positive plate on this field is going to attract the partial negative charge. The negative plate will attract the positive charge and also repel the negative, and the whole molecule turns and spins. That is going to play out, and that will uh, show up in some of the other properties that polar bonds are going to exhibit. All right, back to coffee. If you were really looking forward to the answer to this, I've got bad news for you. It's not only a bad teacher joke, it's a bad chemistry teacher joke. Hopefully not a bad chemistry teacher, but a bad joke, anyhow. Um, however, coffee is a very complicated mixture. Most natural substances are hundreds of compounds, possibly thousands of compounds in there, some of them giving the color, the pigment, the, the brownness, some of them giving the flavor. Of course, there's also going to be the caffeine. The exact chemical profile for any cup of coffee is going to be related to the beans it came from, and that's going to uh, be influenced by the geography, where on the mountain, how much sunshine, the soil that was there, and also how it was roasted. So we'll talk about a dark roast or a light roast or a medium roast, and all of those things are going to have a different chemical profile, which gives us a different flavor profile. How much it's roasted will also influence uh, some of the other compounds that are there. So not only affecting the flavor, but if it's roasted for longer, it typically will have less caffeine because the caffeine starts to come become, it'll start to react with and break down because of the heat. Also, those some of those very complicated chemicals in a cup of coffee will start to react with oxygen. So you'll find that that uh, as coffee sits and on the warmer for a while, it starts to change its flavor and also its color. So it's a very, very complicated mixture, very fascinating mixture, and of course, keeps us awake at night. Now you know. Talk to you in class. See you later.